Welcome into the Ether, a podcast focusing on all things Ethereum, the leading blockchain for decentralized applications. I'm Eric Connor, your host and founder of ETHUB, a decentralized information hub for Ethereum. Into the Ether features deep dives on topics with prominent guests in the community, as well as ETHUB weekly recaps featuring Anthony Sassano. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the ETHUB Weekly Recap. In these episodes, Anthony and I will discuss highlights from the ETHUB Weekly Newsletter. First this week, Anthony, I want to pass it to you to discuss what you announced in this week's newsletter. Hey, Eric. Uh, so yeah, this week we announced the the merger between uh, Block by Block and ETHUB. Uh, for those that don't know, Block by Block is a, um, a resource and research website slash newsletter that I've been running for, I think it's about 39 weeks. So yeah, I sent out the 39th edition this week. Um, and I got to speaking with uh, with Eric a few weeks ago. And um, we really hit it off. Uh, we we're both really passionate about, you know, producing content for the community. And, um, and, and you know, Eric was starting this ETH hub thing. So I thought uh, it po- it's probably best to, to merge the two efforts. So um, that's what we've done. Uh, if you'd like to see the full, uh, full details of that, it is in the newsletter that we'll link in the show notes for everyone. Um, but yeah, so I'm really excited to, to do this podcast uh, and, and get it out there. Uh, it's basically just going to be a weekly recap of um, the newsletter, all the highlights and everything like that, from the news to project updates, um, you know, to things we're seeing in the Twitter sphere. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll get started. Yeah, and we'll jump straight into the news. So Eric, did you see this week that the, uh, the SEC um, going after the ICO promoters, uh, DJ uh, Khaled and, and Floyd Mayweather? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can't say I'm too surprised. I kind of remember the day during the ICO craze when I think I was on Instagram and I I probably follow Floyd Mayweather or someone showed me or added me in a mention and uh, it was Floyd, I think, sitting on a plane with like, I, maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but I'm pretty sure he had like a briefcase open with gold watches or something like that on a, on a private jet promoting ICOs. And, you know, I kind of thought to myself, well, first of all, I probably should have sold the top at that point. But uh, <laughs> beyond that, you know, you kind of knew that these guys were being come after. And it seems like they also weren't really reporting um, these gains they were or these payments they were getting from these companies for their taxes. And that's why the uh, SEC came after them. But, you know, I'm sure... Unfortunately for someone like Floyd Mayweather or DJ Khaled, you know, a little fine from the SEC didn't hurt them. But, you know, I'm sure a lot of people that kind of bought into these ICOs did get hurt. But what, what are your kind of your, your take on this? Yeah, so it was quite funny. Um, for those that, that don't know, the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission um, in the United States that regulates uh, kind of the trading of, of securities and, and other investment assets. Um and yeah, so this week they announced that they had settled a, a, a case with with the the two kind of celebs, uh, and they both had to pay basically uh, penalties. Uh, the penalties were actually quite large, uh, not large for them, of course. So Mayweather had to pay three hundred thousand dollars in uh, in fines, um, and then he had to pay uh, fifteen thousand in interest and three hundred thousand in disgorgement. Um, and uh, DJ Khaled had to pay fifty thousand in disgorgement, a hundred thousand penalty, and uh, three thousand in interest. And what's funny is the money that they made from uh, from these ICOs was actually quite small. I think Mayweather got paid a uh, hundred thousand dollars for his um, his Centra promotion. And you know when he's making hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for every kind of uh, uh, boxing match he's in, it's 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 weird that he would take something like this. Uh, whether he was naive to the fact that he um, had to disclose the fact that he was promoting an ICO um, or not is, you know, another thing. But I guess some people are just really greedy. <laughs> um, you know, another thing I found really interesting after after this kind of announcement came out, all the, I guess you could call them uh, Twitter influencers and YouTube influencers that had been kind of uh, promoting ICOs in 2017 and talking about all these token sales, they, they started to run scared a little bit and post disclaimers about what they got paid from the company, you know, um, saying that, oh, it's not investment advice, uh, like that was going to protect them. I just think it was really funny to see them kind of scramble. Um, and then all the all the replies on Twitter of everyone saying, you, uh, you know, joking about you're going to jail and like tagging the SEC's Twitter account. I just, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny uh, from looking from the outside in, but I'm sure that they're all kind of uh, pretty nervous at this point. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sure some people are scared, and that's always the classic like disclaimer 12 months after the fact. <laughs> like, oh, I'm sorry I sold you this token and it's down 99%, but please forgive me at this point. And, you know, it's a, I totally agree with you. It's amazing to me that someone like Floyd Mayweather, who is making, you know, hundreds of millions to fight on pay per view, would be willing to take a couple thousand dollars to promote an ICO. Like, how did that even happen? Like, the, in my opinion, maybe the only way that happens is if it was like a buddy of his that was doing this ICO and he just kind of did it for a side gig but you know it's baffling to me and you know i definitely think the ico craze taught us a lot i mean a lot of people kind of use it as fud against ethereum now in all reality like it was just a single use case of ethereum like decentralized crowdfunding is very powerful but you know i i do think there's an issue with we're a social media culture now, right? And people kind of at times don't think for themselves. And I'm of the belief that if it's your money, you know, you should, you're responsible for what you invest in. But at the same time, you can't have people all over social media shilling obvious scams and obviously BitConnect, you know, the famous Carlos, hey, hey, hey. Um, you can't have people actively promoting Ponzi schemes on YouTube. So, you know, I think there's a slippery slope here with how do you regulate this and how do you punish people that are involved? But I, I think the SEC, you know, they they don't have unlimited resources. They're not following all these tweets of people tagging them as funny as it is. In all reality, they're just trying to make examples out of celebrities that were doing this to try to discourage others from t taking part in it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I agree with everything you said. Uh, and it's pretty funny you spoke about, um, you know, I don't know what the fix is for this and kind of it leads into how do people, um, you know, go about filtering out the noise, um, which is a, a huge problem in crypto or in general. Um, and that kind of leads on to the next bit of news that came out this week uh, where uh, Reuters did a, Reuters, I think that's how you say it. <laughs> they did a report uh, about crypto reviews being for sale. Now, this is kind of like, I thought it was quite obvious that that this uh, this was happening. So like a lot of the ICO review sites, um, you know, would would give uh, certain ICOs favorable, favorable reviews, even though it really didn't make sense. Um, and it came out that basically there were, there were whole uh, companies set up to um, write fake reviews. So, and, you know, a lot of people would have put trust into these websites in 2017 because it was, um, you know, they were nice websites. They didn't look scammy or anything. They just had the token, the details of the, of the sale, you know, the team members, advisors, and, and then you had the reviewers. So the reviewers would usually be like blockchain expert or cryptocurrency expert or something. And a lot of newer, newer investors to the space wouldn't have known that that's kind of a uh, you know, it's a really dumb title. It doesn't really make much sense. No one's a blockchain or crypto expert. No one knows, you know, where the market's going to go up or down. Um, you know, and, and the sad thing is a lot of these promoted tokens have gone down 90, you know, 90 plus percent. Uh, and a lot of people have lost money because of this. Uh, so, yeah. Well, what did you think about that? The, the crypto reviews being for sale uh, story? Yeah, I mean, I guess it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I remember seeing a report a couple months back. I, I forget who put it out, but that even, you know, crypto news and blog sites were taking cash to write stories. You know, there's very kind of few clean publications out there at this point. And, you know, so it definitely doesn't surprise me that reviews were being paid for as well. I mean, I even have a couple people I'm close to in the community that randomly an ICO website would show them as a contributor or an advisor on the website. And all of a sudden their picture would just show up and they've never talked to these people in the past before. So, you know, I think that was kind of rampant, these ICOs, you know, and not all of them, obviously there's, there's tons of legit projects that went through ICO and fundraising, but some of these, you know, maybe that were kind of catching on to the tailwind of the ICO craze, just literally taking people's social media pictures and, and putting them on websites. So, you know, I think, again, go back to this slippery slope, like how do you regulate this? But, you know, we can't have people actively promoting scams. And I think we've already seen that cleaned up. Like the 2018 bear market has helped a lot. Kind of going back to Bitcoin, you know, even in 2013, 2014, you saw some of this stuff. Just kind of as you go through a bear market, a lot of this gets cleaned up. And, you know, I think that's if there's anything positive that comes out of that, it's, it's that. And so, 
you know, again, people are responsible for their own investments. And this stuff happens in stocks too, right? Like, I mean, I would argue someone like some of the big media outlets and or some of the channels, financial channels that promote stocks. I mean, those those uh, companies have vested interest in pumping or dumping certain stocks and companies, and I'm sure they're being paid. I mean, the top execs at some of these companies maybe have vested interest in certain stocks. So this isn't just a crypto problem, right? I think it's being exploited right now as that because we're kind of going through this very large rise and then demise. But this isn't just a problem that's related to crypto. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's it's funny you should touch on on those points with regards to traditional markets. Um, because another piece of news that came out this week was that um the SEC chairman said the an ETF or a crypto ETF is on hold because of um, you know, manipulation in the crypto markets. And I saw a lot of chatter um, you know, on Twitter, on Reddit about uh how it's rich, he would say that considering how much manipulation goes on in the traditional markets. Um and I thought that was a bit bit silly to say that um it's basically saying that oh okay there's manipulation in crypto uh who cares let's just um let's just have an etf anyway and i think it it just reflects a lot of the you know some of well maybe not everyone but a lot of people um the sentiment is just that uh, we need an etf because it's going to you know pump the price of of crypto you know bitcoin ethereum whatever um which is which is naive in itself uh to begin with uh, I personally believe an ETF is currently a, a pipe dream uh, for crypto um, just because of well, what we've been talking about, all these scams that pop up, uh, you know, a lot of different Ponzi's uh, that can get quite large, like BitConnect got into the top 10, um, a lot of, uh, you know, failures in due diligence. Um, and a quick shout out there to Concourse Q if you're um, looking for actual due diligence on projects, um, especially ICOs. We'll link it in the show notes, but but they're really good. Um, but other than that, most of the the, the sites out there, it's just uh, really bad. It's really bad data, um, really bad um, reviews and, and paid articles. And you know, the uh, no one's going to approve an ETF when when that sort of stuff's going on. It's um, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert on 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 what it takes to approve these things or any of the laws and regulations. But you know, if if the chairman's coming out and saying that uh, we need to kind of clean up our act, then you know, it's quite obvious what needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way to go about it isn't, hey, this happens over there, so it's okay to happen here too, right? Like you said, we we need to strive for better than that. And there's no doubt that we're years away, in my opinion, um, from an ETF. And it shouldn't be the end-all be-all either, right? I mean, a lot of people kind of compare it to the gold ETF. But to be honest, the gold ETFs kind of launched during a global recession. I'm not so sure that the reason for gold completely kind of going through the roof during the ETF phase was due to an ETF, right? I think it was due to more worldwide economical problems. So I kind of wish that you know the crypt. Uh, of course, the crypto market, especially right now, is very obsessed on price. I kind of wish we could step away from that. And I think that's one good thing the Ethereum community does is kind of disconnect development from price. So you have kind of your investor side and you have your developer side, and they talk and they're both interactive and they cross, of course. But um, we shouldn't always be obsessed on price. But I agree with you. I mean, to me, ETF such an afterthought. You know, I'm, I'm more personally worried about trying to get things out there like scaling and privacy and user experience that's great if we get an etf and maybe price pumps a little bit but at the end of the day it's probably one of those short lasting things you know it it doesn't change the underlying fundamentals of everything so i definitely agree with you on these facts and who knows maybe if if someone forced me to guess when bitcoin or ethereum might get an etf at this point i'd probably say the year 2023 that would be my assumption yeah, I mean that makes total sense. Uh, twenty twenty three is quite um, quite late, though. I'm sure you're going to break a few hearts with that prediction. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, I, I do like what you said about um, you know focusing on. Obviously, we're we're really into the the Ethereum space, being that this is the F Hub podcast. Um, <laughs> but um, in saying that, I, I do believe that we're not kind of worth the the prices that we uh, went to in twenty seventeen, like. There's no way Ethereum was worth over 100 billion and Bitcoin was worth whatever it was worth at the time. I think it was like 300 billion or something. Um, you know, uh, there's still there's still a lot that needs to be done. Still not a, bi- a lot of building that needs to be done. We're not we're not exactly providing much value to the world in general. Like Vitalik bangs on about this all the time. 
um, saying that what have we done to deserve kind of this, you know, this market, this this valuation. Um, and, you know, I agree, with, I agree with them. We haven't really done much. Uh, but, you know, during bear markets is when a lot of the building gets done because people are uh, less distracted um, and a lot, a lot of projects start putting out, uh, you know, uh, really good updates. And, and you see which which projects stick around are the ones that are in for the long haul. Um, uh, there, there's a few, there's always updates coming out each week. Uh, you know, just this week, uh, what was really cool was um, Harbor, which is a tokenized security platform. They launched, um, you know, they tokenized the building. Um, which was which is really cool. This is this kind of concept has been talked about a lot of, you know, tokenize all the things, um, but they actually went and did it. Uh, so they they tokenized the building, um, and the token represents a, a kind of share of the building. So I think there was uh, 955 shares uh, minted as tokens, and they were priced at twenty one thousand dollars each for a total of uh, twenty million dollars of private equity in something called the Hub at Columbia. So um, that'll be linked in the in the newsletter in the show notes. Um, but uh, yeah, just to clarify, a lot of people go on about tokenized securities like they you know, it's not the token doesn't represent your you know your ownership of the of the security of the asset or whatever, and that's true. the The token itself, um, well, the token itself is a representation of it. But just because, for example, if you were to lose the you know access to that token, you're not going to lose access to your share in the building. It would still be going through the the normal process of of contracts and like kind of. Uh, the, the you know the, the legal system whatever um, you know re- it would still be registered in kind of uh, the, the meat space um, uh, part of it um, so but it's still cool to see this kind of stuff happening because once you tokenize these assets especially on ethereum uh, you unlock the you know the potential of these assets to be traded on um, you know decentralized finance apps so the most obvious one is kind of you know imagine using this building that was tokenized the, the token um, to as collateral for MakerDAO CDPs. Uh, I think that would be really cool. Uh, there's all kind of, uh, you know, use cases like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what did you think about this? Yeah, I mean, this is a concept I'm actually very bullish on. I've been thinking about for a while, and I have a friend who is a real estate developer, and I'm definitely not an expert in commercial real estate, but essentially, you know, every once in a while, uh, a commercial real estate developer wants to start a project and maybe it's not the easiest thing to just go to an investor or a bank and find funding, right? Or maybe their rates aren't that good or whatever it might be. But in all reality, there's probably a lot of people out there looking to get involved in something like that, but they can't put up, you know, say a $20 million loan for an apartment building by themselves. Um, So this kind of breaks that down and allows people to invest in different types of assets. I I think the power here is huge. Um, You know, if you want to get exposed to commercial real estate right now, I guess you could buy into a REIT or some kind of ETF stock, but, you know, owning ownership in a building maybe it's in your area maybe it's something that you feel passionate about that area is about to expand and blow up um you know and then getting a token for that ownership is so cool kind of like you said like the possibilities are endless and at times i get a little bit scared of the derivative product products that are going to come out of this um you know i kind of laugh you you take your share in your commercial real estate project down the street and you maybe trade some of it for (laughs) a card on god's unchained and then you use that to leverage a short like the products here are insane and hopefully we come up with some kind of uh good governance or security around these but you know in general this is kind of the concept of decentralized finance which is extremely exciting and just kind of opening up these all these new realms of possibilities around finance yeah exactly um you know as we said the the interoperability of um you know, uh, the Ethereum network with, with the different tokens and with the different, um, apps is kind of the killer use for, for this sort of stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to see what, uh, what Harbor does and what other projects do in this space and what other assets get tokenized. And, you know, if we start seeing these, these tokens actually being used in, in the apps themselves, um, you know, I always joke that we're building, uh, we're creating the next financial crisis on Ethereum. And <laughs> um, as you were saying about building different uh, derivatives and, and using things as leverage, I think that's that actually might be true, <laughs> you know, in the next few years, unfortunately. But it comes with the territory. This is what happens when you um, do things in kind of a permissionless way where everyone in the world can, can access it. And it's kind of unstoppable as well. So no one can, you know, tell you what you can and can't do uh, to an extent, I guess, like, 
a lot of this, uh, you know, for example, this this tokenization of this building is is heavily regulated. Um, you know, KYC, AML, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I think it's specifically tied to an address as well, so they'll be able to know where you've sent it to. It's not it's not anonymous at all, but you know, it's the first step and it's a kind of proof of concept, uh, which I thought was was really cool. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think one point I want to make, and just as we go through. You know, the, these all these podcasts and these weekly recaps and ETHUB in general, like I definitely want to be clear that, you know, it's not all roses on the Ethereum side, right? I think we're going to have a fair take on both sides of things. And I think one thing that definitely, and we were just talking about is not too discussed is all of these <laughs> derivative project products that are going to be kind of taken out of decentralized finance. I mean, obviously, one of the reasons for the 2007, 2008 kind of world economy collapse were kind of derivative products, credit default swaps, and credit and leverage that people didn't quite understand. And I definitely want to kind of caution the community. And there's definitely some out there that have had voices on this before us, but kind of caution the community into making sure that we have proper controls around these products. And it's not like we're we're trading and shorting and longing things that we don't even understand and can't unwind. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm all for better controls around these sorts of things. I'm not sure how it pans out because, you know, as we've seen, Maker DAO has already gotten quite uh, quite big um, just naturally. Uh, you know, 1.5 million ETH locked up. Uh, kind of, you know, some people say it's a risk or maybe the smart contract gets hacked or whatever and, you know, the ETH gets stolen and then the ETH, price would dump or whatever, you know, similar to what happened with the Dow. But, uh, you know, I think Maker in general are, are pretty pretty good. They're, they've got a um, 100 mil limit on the, how much DAI could be could be minted. So there are limits in place and there are checks and balances. The system's designed, um, you know, with a ton of checks and balances in place. But at the end of the day, um, uh, the nature of these networks is that, uh, you know, you can put in as many roadblocks as you want, but people will always find a way around it. You know, you can shut down decentralized exchanges, uh, you know, like Ether Delta or, or find them or do whatever. But then another one will pop up like Uniswap, for example, um, you know, that'll be different and have a different spin on things and be even more permissionless. And eventually we're going to have exchanges and products completely decentralized where you can't even shut down the front end because it's hosted on IPFS or, or some other distributed storage. So, you know, as much as I think the checks and balances are are, are, are really important and regulations around this are important, um, I think it's going to require a lot of goodwill um, from the community and a lot of um, education around it too. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. Uh, just based on, on, on you know, looking at history, uh, when people get ahead of themselves with greed, uh, with money, it doesn't end too well. <laughs> um, but, you know, I remain cautiously optimistic, uh, you know, I should say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm extremely optimistic on the products coming out and it's just important to always exercise caution. I, I can kind of see the next bull run, to be honest, being fed by decentralized finance. Um, so I just hope that we treat it properly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, agreed, agreed. Uh, so yeah, so next bit of uh, project update comes from Masari. So for those that don't know, uh, Masari is a, um, a website, masari.io. Um, they provide uh, their aim is to provide better crypto data, uh, kind of resources and research around crypto. And this goes back to the points that Eric and I were making before um, about uh, kind of the, the amount of noise in the crypto space and and the, the noise to signal ratio just being you know way out of whack. There's no uh, good trusted place to go to to get um, information on you know certain different projects. Um, but Masari announced this week that they've launched uh, their kind of disclosures registry with their first uh, set of partners. So but this is basically a bunch of, um, you know, a bunch of partners, a bunch of crypto projects, uh, f uh, such as um, Aon, Zilliqa, District 0x, you might have heard of those, um, Ocean Protocol, there's a few more in there. They've basically committed to being um, as transparent as possible uh, with with the community. So they'll, uh, they'll submit updates to, to Masari, um, things like treasury uh, balances, you know, when they move their, their tokens or when they're going to sell uh, their tokens. Uh, you know, uh, projects like District 0x have already been doing this on their own. Um, so if you go to their website, you can actually go through the whole transparency section and see see everything they've been doing, you know, entire breakdown of, um, you know, the salaries, uh, why they've taken money out, what they've done with it, 
Um, you know, Aragon is another project that 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 does this too. So uh, I really like this in- initiative from Masari because it's it's sorely needed uh, as we've we've seen, um, and I hope more people start using it um, because without this kind of you know, good information, good data, um, good resources and, and research pieces to reference. We're just going to repeat 2017 if, you know, if there's another crypto bull run where the market gets extremely heated and everyone throws out all the fundamentals and just starts buying absolute, you know, garbage and, and falling for every every scam because there's just um, an onslaught of, of noise. Uh, so I'm, I'm just really happy to, to see this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm a big fan of Masari, first of all. I think the products they're putting out and kind of their dashboard and all their stats, they they create a lot of unique stats. Um, I really like what they're doing. And anytime you're kind of getting more open data in the crypto space, uh, that's a big step forward. I mean, any it's hard to come by good data in general, to be honest. I mean, I know you could, if you're complex and you know what you're doing as far as writing maybe um, some Python code or um, I know obviously Google kind of released their um, data uh, big query, I think it's called of the Ethereum chain the other day. I started messing with that, but it's not that deep. I mean, all I wanted to do was basically pull a list of uh, um, Ethereum Genesis blocks and see the accounts and how much money they moved. And even that's hard to come by. So anytime we're getting kind of more open data is good. And I, I like what they're doing there. So, you know, I, 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 <laughs> gone on some Twitter rants against a few news sources out there. Um, I guess I'll specifically call it Coindesk that released their Crypto Economics Explorer, where in my opinion, they're blatantly trying to give Bitcoin the number one spot. I mean, they're measuring developer activity. and The only thing they're measuring for Ethereum is the Geth repo, which is one of, you know, 72, I think, Ethereum repos. So anytime you're getting kind of a fair balance to me, and Masari is kind of not very biased and giving a fair take to any coin out there. They have a lot of metrics where, you know, some coins are won and some coins are last. So I, I think that's good for the space. Yeah, I think that the key point you raised there is bias. So uh, that's another huge issue with crypto in general, right? Where, you know, depending on what coin you hold or what project you're a fan of, you're you're going to swing in that direction. And, and, you know, we're guilty of it too, of course. Um, everyone's guilty of it. It's very hard to to be unbiased when you're kind of, um, you know, wallet depends on it, at, <laughs> so to speak. So uh, it's good to see some attempts at this. Um, you know, I hope they, I hope a lot of these um, newer publications that have come out um, and, and newer kind of uh, news resources uh, remain unbiased uh, for for as long as possible, um, and I hope that the community calls out that uh, keeps calling this out. So you know, you mentioned CoinDesk. I, I always see the replies um, on the on the tweets saying, you know, this was built on Ethereum because CoinDesk seems to never mention Ethereum. Um, you know, whether it's the article or the tweet, uh, it's just um, it's really frustrating seeing that happen. And, and there was actually a, a Twitter account called Built on Eth that um, that came. That was created a, a few weeks ago, and it was it was quite funny seeing that because I just basically retweet every CoinDesk article and say built on Ethereum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's a one of my favorite accounts that's popped up, and I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's up to the, the community to call out this bias, right? There's of course going to be bias. Everyone has bias, but if you're putting yourself out there as a news publication. Um, and claiming you don't have bias, it's important to look for it and call it out. And it's not always just in favor of Bitcoin, obviously. There's publications that are in favor of each different coin. But you know, this, the sources I really look for when I'm trying to compare different coins are the ones that don't have a bias to any single coin. And that that's where the valuable data comes from. You know, Just raw data, they develop all kinds of metrics, which makes some coins look good, some coins look bad, and it's kind of up to the user to judge. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and just on the, on the bias front, uh, in the context of Masari, I know that one of the original goals, uh, and they're probably still working on it, I just haven't um, heard too much about it lately, was their um, token curated registry where they'd basically um, curate a list. Um, you know, the list could be anything, uh, you know, a, a, a list of, um, of, of projects, a list of uh, whatever you want, um, but they'd use the, the community to curate it and it would kind of have... Uh, Crypto economics built in. Um, I'm not an expert on, on token curated registries, but there's a there's a few uh, research pieces that I'll leave in the show notes for people that want to look into that. But I, I, that was Masari's kind of, um, I guess you could say, remedy to the the bias situation. Um, but then 
it's funny you, you look into these things and, and and bias will still come into it even if you've got uh people have you know skin in the game or, or money and and they put up money and if you know if they're providing the incorrect data they they lose they lose the money um you know there could still be collusion there could still be people with with lots of money that basically uh, you know pay off certain things um, or collude with other people uh, that stuff's going to happen but I, I do like the the you know the idea and the attempt to to use what we already know, like use the game theory from crypto for something like like lists and 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 you know collating and good data and research. Yeah, and I th- I think one you know one way to kind of combat this bias is kind of the vision we have for EthHub, right? It's EthHub is just about Ethereum. It's trying to get facts out there about Ethereum, what it is, the things being built on it, what it's to be used for. And we're not comparing against the other coins. It's just here's Ethereum, here's what it is, here's what it can be used for. And we're also not taking any funds in, right? That's one of the big problems with news and media sources is, is they're looking for clicks, they're looking for ad revenue. Um, some are looking to get paid for their articles. I think that's a completely wrong way to go about things. So, you know, I just want to throw out there that's that's kind of the core vision of EthHub is this open source, just documentation to talk about Ethereum. I'm not worried about comparing to other coins. I'm not worried about getting paid for our documentation or anything like that. That's it's not what we're looking for. Yeah, exactly. And I think the um the key there was uh, that the fact that it's open source. So everything that goes into into ETH Hub will be completely open source. Everyone will be able to read uh, everyone, everyone will be able to see the pull requests, the the changes, uh, what was in there, what isn't in there. Um so yeah, we we're, we're not in it to to make ethereum look good we're actually in it to just provide the information so people can make their own kind of decisions so yeah um so yeah i'll move on to the next kind of point uh in our next project update was uh aztec protocol was announced so uh they announced their funding i think they raised over two million dollars in consensus um the ethereum kind of uh company based uh focused company i should say um was uh, was one of the lead investors uh, so this protocol basically uses a similar technology to what's used in Zcash to bring kind of private transactions to Ethereum, uh, which I thought was really cool. Um, so Aztec protocol is actually targeting banks. So they're trying to get banks um, away from using maybe private consortium blockchains and, and start using the public chain because one of the uh, big barriers uh, to entry for them was the fact that everything was public. So obviously that's not going to work uh, work for banks um, so I thought that was a really cool announcement. I'm, I'm curious to see where that goes. Um, did you did you see that one as well, Eric? I did. Yeah, it's pretty cool development. I mean, I I like it. Makes sense to try to target banks with you know um, privacy right on the main chain because there's a lot of benefits to contributing to the main chain and getting off of a private chain. Um, you know, I understand why companies, especially banks at the start would kind of gravitate to a private chain because they're able to kind of hide the transactions for their customers. And, you know, you don't want to have public out there, you know, who opened a mortgage for what value or how much deposit someone has. And that's one of the downfalls of the, the current Ethereum public chain. But I love seeing all these privacy solutions come on. And I think I saw that they already had a uh, zero knowledge die implementation working on the live main chain, which is pretty cool. I mean, I think we're getting closer to a lot of these solutions than people realize. And I know the cost of kind of running some of these um, ZK Stark, ZK Snark solutions um, on Ethereum are costly from a gas pers- perspective. But it seems every time I look, see, read about the latest one, um, that gas cost has come down a little bit. So, you know, this is exciting stuff. I think people are intimidated by ZK Starks and not a lot of people understand that they can be a scalability solution as well. And we're going to have an episode on that in our scaling kind of mini series coming up in a few weeks. But, you know, this is good stuff. And, you know, of course, consensus is involved, which is a good sign. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I thought the, yeah, the die implementation uh, was, was really cool. Um, You know, for those that don't know, die is a a stable coin. Um, uh, run by MakerDAO, so you basically you mint it. It's um, crypto collateral, uh, crypto backed stablecoin. So you put in some ETH, um, you collateralize um, your position by one hundred and fifty percent or or above, and you can take out uh, some some die. So basically, one die equals one US dollar. 
Um, and basically what, what this, uh, what Aztec protocol did as a proof of concept was make a private DAI implementation where you could send DAI over, you know, the Ethereum network and it'd be completely private. So yeah, I thought, I thought that was, was super cool. Um, you know, and just on the privacy front as well, I, I did want to briefly mention that we saw Coinbase list Zcash, um, this week, which was not surprising at all. Uh, I saw people calling for this to happen for weeks and months since Gemini, uh, listed it. Um, which was, you know, it was surprising when Gemini listed it, considering that Zcash is a privacy coin and how it would play with regulators in terms of uh, KYC, AML and kind of tracking of, of people using Zcash. I, I was interested to see what the regulators would would say on that. Um, but uh, I think they, they found a middle ground, uh, Gemini and, and obviously Coinbase have now. So the, the Zcash works. Um, so Zcash is a privacy coin, but it works uh, a little bit differently. It's not private um all the time, like something like Monero, it's uh, optional privacy. So there's um, transparent addresses and then shielded addresses. Uh, so the way the regulators kind of allowed these uh, exchanges to list this coin was because you can only withdraw Zcash from Coinbase to a transparent address, which means that they can still track it, um, track who, which address it was uh, withdrawn to. Um, you know, Gem- Gemini and Coinbase are both both doing this. Uh, you know. And I thought that was a, was an was an okay middle ground, um, but it, and and from there you can you can probably uh, hide your tracks anyway um, using these coins. Um, but it was it was still good to see Coinbase list another you know quality asset uh, rather than something else. You know they've got a couple of assets on there that I don't really think should be on there. <laughs> um, but it was good to see them with Zcash because um, you know Zcash and Ethereum are, are really friendly. The development teams are really friendly with each other, and I think Ethereum can. Can absorb, um, you know, a lot of the the Zcash tech and 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 upgrade the network using a lot of the the tech that's been already, you know, battle tested by the Zcash network. Yeah, it was it was nice to see uh, Coinbase at it, and you know, Zcash is one of the projects I'm pretty excited about. Definitely, at least the technology behind it. Um, I think there's some value there, and I agree with you. There's been some questionable ads in the past. I'm not going to name any names, but you know, I'm I'm kind of getting to a point. I'm a little exhausted about the whole hype around Coinbase ads. I, I'm getting the sense that the market is a little bit too obviously kind of given the state of the market right now. That's not too surprising, but you know, in the past, you know, it was hype, hype, hype. What's Coinbase going to add? And then it added it, and it would pump. Now it's kind of getting into this phase where. It gets added to Coinbase Pro and everyone gets excited. And then there's a week before it's actually added to the real Coinbase. And between that time, the market dumps it. It, It's just kind of turning into whale games. I mean, to be completely honest with you, I know Coinbase is trying to probably adhere to regulations in this, but I feel there's a bit of a hype game going on too. And I kind of wish one day they would just come out and say, look, we're adding 50 assets and, you know, have your fun instead of kind of this constant, Oh, what's Coinbase going to add? What's Coinbase going to add? Um, but you know, I, I think going back to Zcash a little bit and even back to the Aztec protocol that we were talking about, uh, privacy is vitally important right now. You know, I think, we, we talk a lot about it on the podcast, privacy, but it, you can barely even share your Ethereum address right now with someone that you don't 100% trust if that's an address you use a lot because they can track everything that you've done. So bringing this technology onto Ethereum is vitally important at a point. It's just as important as scalability which is just as important as user experience. You know, these are kind of the three things we absolutely need. So to kind of just see more focus and publicity to something like Zcash, I think is beneficial to the entire ecosystem in the long run. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think yeah, privacy is just behind scaling. Um, I, I, you know, I'd argue that they'd probably both at the same kind of importance, um, in terms of what upgrades uh, crypto networks need to see. Because if we have scaling and no privacy, it's still not going to be used by by too many people, uh, especially not institutions, as we were saying before, banks and, and things like that. They're definitely not going to be, feel comfortable using the public chain um, if it's completely transparent. So, yeah, it's good to see, um, you know, the privacy coins getting more support, um, you know, even if it is just an exchange listing, um uh, it still generates hype, like you were meant. You were saying about the kind of you know the Coinbase effect or exchange effect not having much uh, you know effect anymore. But I, I do think that might just be a, a bear market thing. Um, 
you know, Coinbase, uh, I remember when Litecoin got listed on Coinbase in early 2017, that was kind of when the bull market was just heating up. And, you know, Litecoin pumped pretty hard from there. Uh, and then they listed Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash towards the end of the year when the bull market was basically at its peak. Uh, and when we saw what happened then with the uh, Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash kind of price war, uh, which was quite crazy to see. Um, you know, people genuinely thought Bitcoin Cash was going to overtake Bitcoin's market cap. Um, so... I think uh, Coinbase is listing additional asset, uh, assets as they've said they were going to do for a while. Um, they probably would have started list- listing a lot more if it was in a bull market because uh, I've noticed a lot of other exchanges have stopped listing um, as much, like especially uh, Binance. They've they've really calmed down their listing. During 2017, they were listing a new coin like every day and that would pump that coin quite quite high, like 100% plus. Uh, but I guess that's just the nature of, of what market we're in at the moment. But I do hope to see Coinbase, you know, the Coinbase have different kind of versions. They have their Coinbase Consumer, Coinbase Pro, you know, Custody, uh, Prime, all that sort of stuff. But I do hope to see more quality assets on their Coinbase Custody, uh, sorry, Coinbase Consumer platform so that new people to this space don't go on there and see, you know, three different Bitcoins if they were to for some reason list Bitcoin SV. Um so I'd rather they'd keep that sort of stuff to their pro trading platform just um, to one, protect investors uh, from buying into these kind of objectively junk assets. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to cop a little bit of heat for saying that, but we need to, as we were talking about before, we need to kind of uh, be be mindful of these things and, and provide better better data, better research and, and, and be better community members. Uh, you know, this goes for, for the businesses as well. Um, but at the end of the day, it is you know a, m- a money game, and I understand why Coinbase lists these things. They're, they're a business; they need to you know make revenue, uh, so make money, um, generate revenue. So the easiest way to do that is listing additional assets, especially assets that have um, trading volumes in excess of hundreds of millions of dollars on other exchanges. They obviously want a piece of the pie there. Um, so yeah. All right, we'll move on to next bit of news. Uh, another little cool thing I just wanted to briefly mention was uh, My Crypto. They're doing a, a winter initiative where um, f- for the 25 days leading up to Christmas, they were going to do give a security tip every day, uh, which I thought was really cool because we've seen um, through throughout the last couple of years and, and you know, basically for as long as bl- uh, Bitcoin uh, or blockchain or, or crypto was a thing that uh, people really easily lose their assets by not securing them properly whether that's through, um, you know, the emails being ha- hacked or the exchange being hacked or or things like that. So, yeah, my crypto set up this website where you can, every day you go back, you you, you click on, a, on on one of the cards and it'll reveal a security tip for the day. And it's actually just really, really user-friendly so um, and, and really straightforward. It's nothing complex, uh, which I thought was really cool because, you know, something like my crypto or, or my Ether wallet um, would say saw a lot of new people use them in 2017 as their de facto wallet. And I remember Taylor Monahan, um, the the founder of, of my Ether wallet and then now my crypto, um, she used to talk a lot about uh, getting a lot of support tickets from users thinking that my uh, my Ether wallet or my crypto could um, recover their private key or recover access, uh, recover their password because they just didn't understand how it all worked. So, and, and she's put out a lot of really good content um, over the the past few months, um, educating people as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, first of all, of my crypto and everything they've done for the Ethereum ecosystem. And, you know, Taylor had talked at DEF CON 4 a lot as well about security and user experience. And I thought it was a great talk. So anybody that hasn't watched that, um, definitely recommend go watching that. But I like what they're doing. I mean, you really don't see too much of this right now. And coming from a wallet, it's very important because people are kind of interacting with that every day. So seeing these tips come about, and I would just say now, if you are somebody that has crypto and you're keeping it on an exchange or maybe um, keeping it on your local computer or wherever you might be keeping it, if it's not on a hardware wallet, please go buy a hardware wallet right now. It's either a Trezor or a Ledger Nano S. You need to go buy one because 
essentially that crypto is not yours unless it's on a hardware wallet. Uh, local computer is a little bit better than an exchange, but I would still argue that you need to do that. Um, beyond that, make sure you have two-factor authentication set for pretty much every single website you use, um, definitely for every single crypto website you use. And don't use text message 2FA. Use uh, either Google Authenticator or um, Authy or 1Password or whatever your favorite kind of 2FA authenticator is. So I think these are very important lessons. And, you know, I still see kind of sad stories every week, it seems, on either um, the Reddit for cryptocurrencies or ETHtrader or Bitcoin or whatever it is that people think they have their security figured out and they're keeping their funds on exchange and lo and behold, they lose all their crypto. So I, I think these are extremely important lessons. Yeah, exactly. It's um, It reminds me of something that um, Andreas Antonopoulos has been saying you know, for years now. Uh, if you don't own your keys, you don't own um, your coins, basically which, you know, is completely true. So, yeah, so moving on from that, I guess I'll move into a couple of interesting tweets that um, that I came across during the week. So the the most interesting one was from uh, Marco Santori from uh, blockchain.com. So he's a, he's a lawyer um, working in the space and he uh, did a Reddit thread, uh, we'll link in the show notes, about a federal court ruling that ruled against the SEC. Um, so basically the SEC uh, was going after an ICO called BlockVest, um, alleging that it was a, obviously a securities offering. Um, and then the the court actually ruled against that. So I'll, I'll let you um, let the listeners read through the thread because it's quite a lengthy thread. But I did want to call out a couple of points that um, that Marco made, which I thought was, was, was really cool. So he basically said that... Um, Airdrops, uh, based on this ruling, airdrops uh, should, you know, logically not be considered securities on the basis that there was uh, no investment of money and no one's at a risk of kind of financial loss. So, you know, if, if you receive some some tokens into or some coins into a wallet for free and you've done nothing to get it, then obviously you haven't invested any money, you haven't um, given the company any money, uh, and you're not at risk of financially losing anything. Yes, okay, maybe the token will trade higher one day and trade lower the next day, but you didn't invest any money, so you're not going to actually lose any of uh, lose any money. You'll lose potential, you know, gains from not selling those tokens. Um, you know, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, and uh, I mean, obviously, you know, airdrops for people potentially not aware are uh, essentially all of a sudden in your wallet shows up and you have coins from a uh, specific. DAP or startup or whatever it might be. So I, I think this is a very important ruling from the court against the SEC. You know, not only from the perspective of, hey, an airdrop isn't a security, which to me makes total sense. I mean, all of a sudden, if I just have coins in my wallet and I didn't invest in them, you know, like you said, I have no potential loss. So to me, why is that considered a security or a threat or a problem? Um, on top of that, it's kind of nice to see finally a ruling against the SEC when it comes to crypto. They've kind of had free reign to this point. I think people are um, kind of scared of the SEC right now. Some of it, I think, is a little bit unfounded. I feel like you know this is kind of the first challenge they run up against. I feel like there's going to be more. I also feel like they're not trying to be too overarching. I actually think they're a little bit more open than most people kind of think. Of course, you know, we kind of get the spread of fear as is typical in crypto, especially in a bear market. Um, but, you know, the SEC chairman and some of the higher ups in the SEC have been pretty open to um, Ethereum and crypto, in my opinion, so far. Things could definitely be worse. So you kind of mix that with a ruling, you know, kind of for crypto holders or for for uh, crypto founders of companies. And I think it's not all negatives on the side of regulation. I, I think we're going to start seeing some um, embracing coming out of that sector in the future. Yeah, exactly. I see a lot of that, um, you know, a lot of what you've just talked about um, echoed on, on Twitter, uh, the sentiment from kind of people in the weeds, the lawyers in this space. Um, there's a few key ones that, that I follow on Twitter seem to say that they're actually um, quite happy with the way the SEC, you know, is treating this space so far. Uh, they seem to have only gone after the the, the pure scams or, or um, you know, the, the promoters and things like that uh, at, at this point, which I thought was was really cool. Um, you know, and another point um, on this ruling I wanted to, to, to raise, does this include kind of generalized mining? So this is just an open question that I haven't seen any answers to yet. But, um, you know, generalized mining is this, 
concept of uh, basically minting tokens um, by doing work. So uh, uh, Life PR recently did this. It's a project that wants to do video transcoding where you would um, offer up some resources and then be able to kind of mint tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. So, it's, you know, it's, it's very similar to mining. That's why it's called generalized mining. Um, but, you know, would they be considered securities? Um, because you are technically investing money if you're using, you know, hardware to to mine it. But you're not giving that money to life PR themselves. Um, you know, and you're not, uh, the only financial loss you incur is the opportunity cost or, or the, the cost of mining it and the tokens are worth nothing. So I don't know enough about regulations and laws and securities uh, laws to, to comment on that, but I, I'd like to see if I can get an answer to that sometime uh, soon. Um, but yeah, so I'll move on to the last thing I wanted to talk about, which was uh, Joe Lubin's massive tweet storm talking about everything happening in Ethereum. So he sta- he basically started it with blockchain is more than a market, it's a movement, which I'm sure triggered a lot of the uh, Bitcoin, not blockchain people. But, <laughs> you know, they have their fun on Twitter with us all the time. So it's, you know, it's only fair that we hit back a little bit. But basically the tweet storm, uh, it's quite long, goes through a few stats around Ethereum, like, um, you know, the, the daily API request for, um, node provider in, in Fura, um, you know, the amount of Truffle Suite downloads. So Truffle Suite's a developer suite for Ethereum, um, you know, the amount of unique addresses on it, on Ethereum. And then basically a, uh, a list of um, a lot of the major projects building and, and what they're try- uh, building on Ethereum and what they're trying to do. Uh, so I thought that was really cool for um, for Joe to, to break that down. And for those of you who don't know, Joe's um, the founder of Consensus. So I'm pretty sure everyone would know that by now. <laughs> well, I'm hoping they do. Um, so yeah, what did you think of, of that thread, Eric? Yeah, it was a great, uh, great tweet storm. I think I woke up and one of the first things I read in the morning was that. So kind of nice thing to wake up to, but you know, I definitely think it's nice to see. I wish there was kind of more of that. I, there's a lot of focus on price right now and you know, people, Oh, it fell from 1400 to 100. It must be burning and it must be all over. I mean, it just couldn't be further from the truth. And I say a lot that, you know, the, the main Ethereum chain is still at full capacity. Like users aren't going anywhere. We're begging for scalability. There's constant growth in the downloads of Truffle, which is the development suite. There's, I mean, the amount of teams that are coming online seemingly every day and working on kind of the ETH 1.X spec now they're calling it and the ETH 2.0 specs and, you know, building out sharding clients and dApps and it's just it's it seems unstoppable unstoppable to me and it's it's kind of amazing to me that people couldn't see this so i'm kind of glad that joe put those tweets out there and you know obviously joe's done a lot of good things for ethereum and he has a reason to be bullish on ethereum um but i don't think there's anything he said in those tweets that that's wrong by any means or misleading i mean they're all just straight facts and it's very important to look past the graphs and past price and and you know i Anybody that's maybe a naysayer of Ethereum that's listening to this, I, I highly recommend you go read it and, and kind of look into what's actually taking place on the community and development side of Ethereum. Yeah, exactly. It's um, just in, in general, if you read through that thread, it's a, it's a really good kind of primer on everything that's happening in Ethereum. Um, a lot of the, the stuff has actually been happening during uh, the bear market, which is which is really cool to see. So if you do want to learn a lot uh, about all the projects um, building on Ethereum, uh, you know, different kind of different stats, different tools you can use, I definitely suggest going and checking out that that thread. Um, but yeah, so that's that's all we've got time for today. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the the first episode of this weekly recap. Um, we'll obviously be doing this every week and just going through the highlights of the newsletter. Uh, Because I know the newsletter can be quite dense to get through. There's a lot in there, so we wanted to provide this as a as a nice uh, recap you could listen to, you know, on your your morning jog or if you're driving or on your kind of commute to work. Um, So really looking forward to to creating more of these uh, these uh, these episodes. And and do give us feedback if you enjoyed this one. Um, Just just tweet at us, um, or you can you can email uh, info at ethub.io. Thanks for listening to the Into the Ether podcast. You can subscribe to us at podcast.ethub.io, as well as follow us on Twitter at EconOAR and Zazzle0x.